Hey everybody, in this video I'll be going through the history of the Gleam language, we'll be discussing some of the features that make Gleam great, and we'll go into Gleam's standout features. We'll then do a code demo where I'll be using Gleam to solve one of the exorcism exercises, and that will be followed by a listing of the resources that you can use to learn Gleam. I'm excited about Gleam, so let's get started. Gleam was developed by Louis Pilfel. It is a general purpose functional programming language. It runs on the Beam VM, which you might know of Elixir and Erlang. Unlike those two languages, which are dynamic, Gleam is a compiled and statically typed language. Let's go over some of the reasons why Gleam is a great language. First of all, it has fairly little syntax. This means that it becomes easier to learn the language. It also means that if you're collaborating with others on a Gleam project, it will be likely that the code they will be writing uses the same syntactic constructs that you will be using which is a great boon to productivity uh, when you are collaborating with others on a Gleam project. Second of all, the compiler is really lovely. It not only is it very fast, leading to short feedback cycles, it also outputs really helpful error messages. And these error messages can really help you fix all those pesky uh, bugs that you have in your code. A third feature is that it's very fault tolerant. I mentioned before that Gleam runs on the Beam VM, and the Beam VM is famous for running fault-tolerant code. So um, Gleam gets all that goodness from the Beam VM. But the language itself and its standard library also have features that can help with writing fault-tolerant code. So for example, anything that could fail, like parsing an integer, will return a specific re result type. And the result type can be either one where it's OK, so everything went well, or an error. And the caller of such a function will have to explicitly deal with the fact that it, the computation or the invocation could be uh, wrong. So it could give an error, and then you have to explicitly handle that. So this leads to more fault tolerant code because simply you will have to deal with errors which you could possibly forget in other languages. Gleam is also an all batteries included language, which means that if you install Gleam, you get all the goodness that you expect of a language, like a compiler, a build system, a package manager, and a formatter. It's all there installed by default. Gleam also has great documentation. Um, all, the, all the standard library functions have uh, excellent documentation, and there are examples everywhere. But one really nice thing about Gleam uh, is its cheat sheets. So the Gleam documentation currently lists, I think, six cheat sheets for six different languages. And the goal of these cheat sheets are uh, to help you learn the language if you already learn, have learned another language. So there is a cheat sheet, a Gleam for Elixir developers. So if you know Elixir and you want to learn Gleam, this cheat sheet will help you with that and that it will list the differences in which Elixir and Gleam are different. So it will be a very helpful way to get started with the language if you are already if you already know one of these six languages. Um, the Gleam community is also very friendly and inclusive. They have a very nice inclusive message on their website. Uh, uh, we as Exorcist really value that too. So we really appreciate that Gleam makes an effort of being inclusive and uh, showing that to the world. And finally, uh, Gleam can compile to JavaScript and it can even generate TypeScript definitions which can be uh, incredibly useful if you want to uh, use code that was written in Gleam uh, from a TypeScript project. Let's go over Gleam's standout features. First of all, Gleam is very minimal and opinionated. I mentioned before that Gleam has little syntax, but an example of that, for example, is the way that you do control flow in Gleam. In many languages, you would have function calls, if statements, while loops, for loops, etc. So many different constructs to do control flow. In Gleam, though, you just have function calls and pattern matching via the case statement. That's it. That's the only thing that you will ever use. There is no such thing as an if statement or a ternary. You just use function calls and pattern matching. And that is not only very uh, easy to learn because you just have to learn the case statement and then your case construct, and then you would be done with control flow in Gleam. It's also really liberating. You don't have to choose. It's very, very, very powerful and really pleasant to use. And there are other places where Gleam is very opinionated. For example, integers and floats are strictly separate. Um, if you define a number with a dot, it's a float. Without a dot, it's an integer. And that's always the case. 
if you want to divide two integers, you use the slash operator. But if you want to divide two floats, you do slash dot. So they have different operators. Uh, the float and the integer worlds are strictly separate. And converting to them is something that can fail. So uh, you have to deal with that too. And Gleam is awesome in being very opinionated. And it's somewhat akin to what Go does with being very minimal and opinionated too. So you could call Gleam the Go of the functional world. And um, when you work with Gleam Cloud, uh, I think you will highly, highly appreciate how much effort went into making Gleam minimal. It's actually hard to do something very minimal while still making it feel very powerful. The second standout feature is its Beam integration. Um, you can interrupt with code that was written in Erlang and Elixir easily. So you get the benefit of all the code that was already written for those languages. And you can integrate that in your Gleam project without much effort. You also get everything that the Beam offers you, like its fault tolerance, et cetera, and its, its scalability. And its action model in particular is implemented in a very nice way in Gleam. So it's very easy to, to write a bit of code where you have millions of concurrent actors all working in parallel to solve an issue uh, without you breaking a sweat. And the code will look very nice, it's easy to do, and it's just a ton of fun. So highly recommend you trying out everything that you can do with the Beam and all the actors that you can uh, put to good use. It's time to look at some Gleam code. What I'll be doing is I will be solving the RNA transcription exercise in Gleam. If you don't know the exercise, it's about taking a DNA strand, which is a string, and returning its RNA complement, which is also a string. Um, the DNA strand consists of letters, and there are four different letters, and they each are to be translated to a different letter. So there's the list here, uh, G becomes a C, C, G, etc. Uh, and that's the basics of the exercise, and we'll solve that now. Let's look at our starting point. We have a single function called toRNA. That function has a single parameter, DNA, which is of type string, and it returns a result string common nil. So what does this result string nil mean? Well, it means that the toRNA function could fail. And uh, if it fails, it will return an error, and then its error contents will be nil. So we don't actually care about the actual error, just that it errored. Or it could return OK with its contents being a string. So the caller has to check whether or not the value that is returned is an OK, which means that the RNA, the DNA was successfully translated to RNA, uh, or it is an error, in which case there was something that went amiss. Uh, so we couldn't calculate the end result. And we'll see how this works in a, in a second. Let's implement this functionality. The first thing that we need to do is to get the individual letters, which are known as uh, nucleotides in this domain, uh, from the DNA string. So how do we do that? Well, to do that, we need to import the string module. So we will do import glee string, and that gives us access to all the functions in that string module. We can then call string.2 graphemes. And if you're not familiar with graphemes, it's a Unicode concept. But for now, just think of them as these are the letters in the string. So we'll call this nucleotides. So what is the type of nucleotides? It's, it is actually a list of strings. So that's a good place to start with because we can then iterate over the list and translate these things. Before we do that, uh, Let's write the helper function that we will use to translate a nucleotide to its complement. So it's the thing that it should be um, translated to. So the function is called complement. Uh, it takes in the nucleotide, a nucleotide string, and it will return a string. So this is where we do our translation. So let's go back to the readme for a bit and just copy paste this. So just that we have a reference. Uh, okay, so we have to convert C, G to C, etc. So how do we do that? Well, there's only basically one way in which you would be doing this, which is pattern matching. So um, we would do case nucleo, nucleotide, and then have the first pattern match G. And we're saying if G matches, then return this. If C matches, return G. 
if T matches, return A, and if A matches, return U. So this is um, the basic of implementation to translate these nucleotides. And you can see um, it's very straightforward. It's easy to read. It's almost exactly the same as the example with a minor difference. So we'll save that. And the next thing that we need to do is we need to translate all these individual nucleotides to their complements. So let complements be, then what? Um, well, we need to do some list processing. As I mentioned, the two graphemes function returns a list of strings. So to work with strings, we import the gleam slash list module. And with that, there is a list.map function. And that map function takes two arguments. The first is the list that we want to map over. So that will be our nucleotides. And the second is a function that we need to use uh, to specify how to translate the things within the map. So we'll define a function that takes in a single nucleotide. And then um, we'll do the curly braces for the scoping. And we call complement nucleotide. So we'll save it, we'll do a bit of reformatting, and we now have uh, our list of uh, translated nucleotides. So just to reiterate, list.map takes in the nucleotides. Those are a list of strings, and for each individual string, we will call the complement function, and the return value of that will be in this uh, complements uh, list. So uh, we are already well on the way. So um, there are a couple of things that we uh, yet have to do. Um, the result expects to use uh, return a single string, and we now have a list of strings, so we need to combine them. So we're going to do let RNA be string.concat, and then pass in the translated nucleotides. Okay, another small step. And then finally, um, the result type is what we need to return but this is just a plain string. So we need to wrap it in uh, some value of the re that the result type is. And in this case, we'll do okay, because we'll just assume that everything worked well. And now we have a compiling program. So we don't deal with errors yet. We will do that in a second. But for now, let's see if we can get some tests passing. And we have a lot of passing tests. We only have a single failing test. By the way, did you notice how quick this was? It was really, really, really fast. So this is a good first step. The next thing that we need to do is to handle errors. So we're currently assuming that the nucleotide is always one of these four values. But if it's not, uh, we should actually handle that gracefully. So this means that complement can fail. And if a function can fail, what do we do? Well, we return a result value. So we say result string comma nil. Uh, is what we need to return from the complement function. Well, these are all fine, so we wrap them in OK values. This is our, our happy path. OK. So this still compiles, uh, at least this function does. But we also have the case where if it's not any of these four, we should return an error. So the way that we do that is we add a new uh, branch. We'll do the underscore pattern, which will match anything, and we'll return error nil. And uh, the order of patterns within a case statement, a case expression, is important because it will be evaluated from top to bottom. So we'll first try G, then C, then T, then A, and if the nucleotide doesn't match any of those four letters, it will match this wildcard pattern, and error nil will be returned. So that is perfect for our use case. However, we have a problem now because we're doing string.concat on complements, but complements is a, a list of result of strings. So we have a mismatch here. So the map function just try to uh, call complement on every one, single of these instances and then previously returned a string. So we, we would have a list of strings which we can concat, but now we have a list of result of strings and nil. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, um, there's a couple of ways in which you can do this, but the neat thing is that uh, Gleam has a lot of built-in functionality to do with result, uh, with the result type. So there is a thing called trimap. And what trimap does is um, 
it will basically go over a list. And if one of the results is an error, it will stop executing and return that result. And if it isn't, instead of having like a result, a list of these, uh, a list of the results, it will have a result with a list. So it's sort of inverting things. So uh, maybe this becomes clear in a second because uh, this still doesn't compile. It says we expect a list of strings, but we now have a result with a list of strings. So we need to somehow get into that result type to do our concatenation. So the most obvious solution to that would be to use pattern matching. So we do complements and we're saying, okay, um, th these will be, I would say complements. So that's basically now uh, weird because then we would have a duplicate. And that's because this is uh, not just complements, this is complements result because it's now a result type. So we'll do a little renaming. We'll do okay complements. Then we'll do move this here, put it here. Uh, we'll also handle the error case, error nil. And we'll just return error nil. So instead of directly working on the value that is returned from the list.map call, we now have this little try map. This is a result, so we have to pattern match on it to get the the, the translated nucleotides. Uh, and we do that via the case statement. So we have an okay. And in that case, we wrap it in a new okay, but with a slightly different value. So uh, let's run our test and hopefully we should get everything passing. And that's perfect. So hooray for us. Finally, let's do some refactoring. Let's look at this case expression first. The error case is just doing the same thing. So we have error nil, we return error nil. But for the OK case, we do actually do something because we are transforming its content. So the complements are changed. So it's as if we would unwrap the OK, change its value via a function, in this case, string.concat, and then rewrap it into an OK value. This is a common enough pattern that there is a built-in function to do this. And to be able to use that, we will do import gleam slash results. So now we get access to everything, all the functions that are in the result module. And we can, instead of having this, we'll comment this out. We can do result.map and result.map takes two arguments. The first is the result value. So that's complements result. And the second is, an, uh, is a function. And that takes the unwrapped value. So that's the this complements bit. So it's complements and then we'll do uh, curly braces and within it we'll call string concat and complements. Save it. So this result of map will basically be doing the exact same thing that's happening here, but we don't have to write out the, the boilerplate the case and the curly braces, etc. So this is the same thing. And let's just verify by running the test again. And it's all fine. So we can we can get rid of this. Then there's uh, another thing that we can do, which is uh, we have two occurrences where we have a function and that function itself is then merely calling another function. So um, this function takes in a nucleotide, which is a string, and it returns uh, a result of string of nil. The complement function is it takes a string and returns a result of string of nil. So they have the same uh, the same uh, types of parameters and return values. And um, if you have a function that takes a single argument uh, and it calls another function that has the same result value that you want to return, you can basically omit the, the whole boilerplate thing. So uh, instead of doing it like this, we can get rid of the, the wrapper. You can say like this function bits is more like a wrapper around the function. And we'll remove this. And this is exactly the same thing. We're still passing in a function that takes a string and returns a result, a string of nil, but we're just doing it without the additional uh, function wrap around it. So um, we're doing the same thing with the complements here. This is a function that takes in a string and returns uh, a list of strings and returns a string. And that's exactly what Comcat does too. So we can get rid of this. Uh, save it and let's rerun our test and it still works. So there's one final thing that we can do, 
and that's because we have this pattern here where we're calling a function, assigning it to a value, and that value is then used as the first argument to the next function. The result value of that complement result is returned and used as the first value of the next function, etc. So um, this is often called a pipeline in functional programming, where you start out with some data, you apply a transformation, you do maybe a filtering, you apply another transformation, and then you return something. And um, some functional language, including Gleam, have a special operator to, um, to make this a bit more easier on the eye. So what we can do is instead of having a uh, string of two graphemes DNA, we can do DNA and pipe it into the string of two graphemes function. And this is exactly the same thing that we had before. Uh, this will is just a nice shorthand syntax of saying, hey, the thing that you are piping into this function will be at the first uh, parameter. So uh, we can get rid of the nucleotides parameter uh, value and we'll just do the same thing with this list of trimap because the result of this function is piped into the first value here. So we'll do pipe, uh, get rid of all this and get rid of the first argument. We leave the second one, of course, because it, we need it. And this is still the same thing. And then we can this, apply this a third time, do the same with results.map. So we'll remove the first argument that gets passed in from the previous call. And if we call, uh, if we run the test, this should all pass, and it does. So now we have a very functional pipeline, and the, this is very idiomatic, and I like that this um, really signifies uh, to the reader that you have multiple steps in your algorithm. So uh, converting it to graphemes, then try and uh, get all the complements, and then mapping the results. So um, there's nothing wrong with the other version, but I personally like this version a bit better. And I hope you do too. So now we're done with uh, refactoring our code and we have some really nice and simple code to uh, implement our exercise. Let's go over the resources that you can use to learn Gleam. First of all, you can use the Gleam track on Exorcism. We have over 70 exercises that you can choose from and they have a wide variety of difficulties and topics that you can practice. So I highly recommend you trying out the Gleam track. The second resource that you can use is the Gleam book. It's like a language tour, so you get the core concepts all explained. But the beauty of Gleam is that if you just look at the, the left mouse list, it's almost a comprehensive list of everything that's in the Gleam language. So even though it's a fairly short tour, you get most of the syntax exposed to you via this tour. So you're well on your way to get the basics and even maybe some intermediate stuff of Gleam under your belt. Another great resource to use is the documentation on the standard library. So this has everything that is built into the standard library from strings to lists to maps, and they all have nice documentation. Uh, for example, consider the string. Uh, you can see all the functions that are available to you. There are runnable examples, and it's a great resource to use if you learn how, start to learn Gleam. And with that, we've come at the end of this video. I hope this uh, overview of the Gleam language was helpful and interesting to you, and that you're now keen on getting started with Gleam. Um, do give it a try, uh, join the Gleam track on Exorcism, and let us know what you think. Uh, see you next time, bye.